Boom! We're back. I don't know why I always say that. I feel obligated to say that. But uh, I'm super excited tonight. I have uh, an amazing guest for you guys. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. And uh, I cannot begin to express how excited I am for this episode. What's up, everyone? What's up, Austin? Just coming in. Tonight I have Seth Godin on the podcast, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, and a lot of other podcasts I've kind of seen have had... What's up, Rob? I see you with everybody. Uh... People always like talk about, oh, he's like, when the, here he is, coming on now. Sorry, we'll hit wave here, bam. Okay, I know it's a serious podcast tonight because got your request, Seth. I'm drinking water. That's how you know it's serious. No alcohol tonight. We have uh, a legend amongst us. So, <laughs> Seth, how are you, man? Good to see you. I'm great. The lighting's sort of weird, but we're you look trying good. this trying this on the road. I got that. Weird yeah, thing. It's very fitting. Let me just try to change one thing here. Take your time. Take as much time as you need to art direct it. It looks perfect. Uh, my guest tonight needs no intro introduction, but Seth Godin, who is the man. Uh, he's been on the show before. Founder of the Alt MBA, blogger, entrepreneur, and author. An all around great guy. Everyone says, are you, are you nervous about interviewing Seth? And I say, no. The first time I was, and I was very intimidated, and you can at times be stoic, but the first time I talked to you, uh, it was one of the most meaningful, impactful conversations I've had on this podcast. So thank you. It's good to have you back. Great to right. be back. We're launching yes. the Freelancers Workshop today. I know. I know. Today, so the timing's really good. But so, so excited for what you've built here. You have a big following of people who are doing good work. Congrats. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about the Freelancer. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to have you say that. Uh, but let's talk about it. So it's back on the Freelancers Workshop. I'm all about it. I'm a freelancer and... Do you kind of help me navigate those, at times, choppy waters? And, you know, we're really in the thick of it now, Seth. So let's talk Freelancers Workshop. Yeah, well, it starts with what you just said, which is owning it. Like, I'm a freelancer, and I'm proud of it. Yeah. People, you know, are embarrassed. They call themselves entrepreneurs. No, not entrepreneurs. Freelancers. We're doing right. it with our own two hands. Yeah. We made it. And so the question is, if you're going to be a freelancer, how do you move up? How do you get what you deserve? How do you earn the respect? You can't work more hours, right? You just can't. There aren't any yeah. more hours to work. Or Around things start. Around 4 a.m. it gets a little bit shaky, honestly. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or things start to get busy, so you try to hire a junior version of you that's just like you but cheaper. That doesn't work. Right. The only, method, the only method is better clients. Mm -hmm. If you get better clients, they pay you more. They trust you more. They challenge you to go further. They talk about you. They take you to the next level. So then the question is, how do you get better clients? Right. And what I'm trying to help people see is trying to get better clients is the hard part. Yeah. Firing, firing your bad clients and becoming the kind of freelancer who attracts better clients. So, yeah, there's a slog right now. We're in the middle of a tragedy, not just in New York, around the world. Mm -hmm. And the economy is going to be frozen for a while. You're just not going to get calls off the wall from people who say, yeah, I want you to work for me in April 2020. This is not right. going to happen. People so are keeping their cards close to their chest right now in yeah, so, every line of work, no matter how much. Exactly. Right. So, if, so if April is shot, how are you going to spend it? I'm a DJ. I'm totally screwed, Seth. I'm completely screwed. Right. I'm screwed so how are you going to spend it? I think you ought to spend April becoming significantly better at whatever it is people are hiring you to do. Mm -hmm. And don't fret, don't read the news, stay home and figure out how to go from where you are to 10x. And yeah. I don't care if you do it with my workshop or anything else. I just think that's the opportunity that the, the way to be generous is to care enough to get significantly better at what you do. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And I, I, I remember our initial talk, and just to give some context, basically, I was living in Montclair. Uh, I remember... I think that we talked on like on Monday or something like that. But over the weekend, I just got let, let go. I was kind of just ahead of myself a little bit, applying for big jobs and falling short of the mark. And basically, and the short of what you said was that I need to uh, just focus on the craft, focus on the output. On, on the output, I think you said that if I design like uh, Girl Scout cookies, like one box, like every time, um, kind of just like working and honing your craft. And a topic that's come up like 
throughout the this this is the second week doing this now and at first i felt kind of guilty i was like there's kind of no better time than now like i hate to say it but now i'm like no this is the time like you asked for it you said you wanted the time to work on your book to to set it here is your runway and you have to have that mindset because you still wake up every morning and you, you still have to you know to look at you know look at yourself in the mirror and say what have i done or, or what kind of legacy am i building so I think that your your approach of just being, you know, putting aside the excuses. Wait, what is what is the the plumber phrase that you use? I'll make sure I have it here. Oh, uh, the one about plumber's block. Plumber's block. Yeah, a plumber doesn't come and say I can't, you know, I can't do it today. I, you know, a plumber's block. You can't have writer's block. Just sitting down at the table and doing it. So. Yeah, and you know, all this work I'm really doing for the me of 1988. Yeah. Because in from 1987 to 1990 something. I was truly a struggling freelancer because I was basically saying, you can pick anyone. I'm anyone. What do you need? Like, what can I pick up? What can I make go forward? Right. Instead of standing for something and being specific. Yeah. And if someone had sat me down and helped me see that path, it would have saved me a lot of pain and suffering. Yeah, for sure. One of the things I've realized about you, and I think it's, you know, as I joked around about before the podcast about, you know, people that you can kind of seem like intimidating because you're very stoic and stuff like that. But, I think is that you're transparent. Is that something that you've always had or is that something along the lines you needed to make sure that you were clearly, because you're a man of like conviction that comes across very clearly. And some people are kind of like, in today's day and age, especially they're like thrown by it. I like to think of myself that I'm kind of the same way, but is that something you learn over time or is that something that you've always had? I don't think I'm transparent. I think I'm consistent. Consistent, yeah, it's a better way. And there's a huge difference. I don't think people care about authenticity one bit. Yeah. I think if you if you need knee surgery and you're in the operating room and the surgeon comes in and they're like, oh, I had a horrible fight with my spouse. I'm really not in a good mood. You're like, screw that. Yeah. I want you to be the best surgeon in the world. That's who I hired. I don't right, want right, right. an authentic surgeon. Yeah, I want yeah, yeah. a consistent surgeon. For sure. And so I try, I work really hard. When I'm doing my work, it's me. And it's a consistent version of me. Even if I've got a headache, even if I'm afraid, I am going to be the me you expected in this moment. There's a small niche on the internet for the drama of the vulnerability person. Right. Yeah. But that's just, that's like being a stand-up comic. That's not a right. productive way to spend your time. Yeah, the real number of people really doing it is, is like 30, 40 people. Right, yeah. And a whole bunch of people just putting it in, the, in their, their Instagram handle kind of thing. I love that so much. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, hold on. Well, I had something, something right along those lines. I forgot what it was. See, this is the problem. When I, I try, I have Seth, Seth Godin coming on the podcast. I need to be super prepared, but I'm not normally prepared. So Don't worry. Okay. Oh, okay. So how to succeed while, while failing. That was the name of the, the, our initial talk. Um, basically, I explained about, and something that I've always wanted to, to get across in this podcast, and I think you really... You showed me that it was possible to articulate it that day, which was like, you need to stop seeking out the approval of your parents, of the people around you, that reassurance is futile. And that whenever you would hit a major milestone, I have to make a confession here. You said whenever you, you would hit a major milestone, you would feel deeply depressed for non-trivial amounts of times. And I, one night, my wife and I were out at dinner and, and, and she's like, why do you always say that non-trivial amount of time? And I, it's from our conversation. You've got great vocabulary, but reassurance is futile. And reassurance I, I, I needed is to futile. hear it. I wanted my parents to disapprove, but you explained they can't understand. For everyone that's out there that's freaking out about it's, their parents. It's judgment, not for them. Yeah. It's not for them. All right, so a couple of things. First of all, I got to be really clear. I have never been clinically depressed. I don't want to take that word away from people yeah. who are struggling with something real. Yeah. But I've been sad. Lots of people have been disappointed. Yeah. And I'm probably misquoting it also too from No, don't worry. Re <laughs> reassurance. Yeah. Reassurance is a trap. And the mm -hmm. reason it's a trap, and in this moment of worldwide tragedy, so many people want to be reassured. Yeah. It's all gonna be okay. It's all gonna be gone in a week. Everything's gonna be fine. But you know it's not enough because mm -hmm. ten minutes from now you need more of it because it yeah. wears off. It's so much healthier to say, uh, we don't know what's going to happen, but we're resilient. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be a slog. That being realistic about the fact that you don't know what's going to happen opens the door for you to lead and to contribute. 
Because if you are contributing and leading, you get out of your own head and you can right. start working for other people. That's why this is called Meet the Creatives New York, not Meet the Selfish People New York. Right. Because what it means to be a creative is to ship work that matters. Yeah, exactly. For sure. And I think that shipping the work is kind of like the, the, the key word here. I know that you're somebody who's been, you know, a pro. And people always do this in your interviews. So I'm going to make sure I don't do it. I, I told my wife, like, my goal to go in is talk to Seth like we were sitting across each other at dinner, not doing the whole, you're a prolific bestseller, all that stuff. But nonetheless, you sit down and you work at the table all the time. You, you blog every day. What's the record now? How, how long has it been? It's more uh, than give or take a couple of days. 12 years. That's, that's pretty damn good. I mean, I, there was one day that there was a glitch, but I, I've been doing it for 20 years, pretty much. Wow, that's cool. I love how hard you said you are about this thing. I, see, me personally, I would have been like, 20 years. 20 years, haven't missed a day. Um, but, you know, what has your experience been along that journey, kind of just sitting down at the table to do work? You've written so many things. You're, re you're really disciplined in that way. For someone who's maybe struggling to become that person, what's your advice? Yeah, publish lousy work. Right. Keep I'll publishing. Put a lot of shitty work, yeah. Keep publishing lousy work, and it will get better. But if you don't publish lousy work, it won't get better. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you know, if you it, there's a, a an album that's not easy to find of Billy Joel's original demos. Oh, really? And if you listen to them, they're terrible. They're terrible. Yeah. What business did he have showing up in the recording studio at all? They're right. terrible. If you listen to the old demos that Crosby, Stills, and Nash did, the, the, the giant supergroup, their second gig ever was at Woodstock, yeah. right? Yeah. The demos, they're out of key, they don't work, you just... The Beatles have a lot of, I love the Beatles, they have a lot of shitty songs. I'd say Half, half their average. songs are below average. Yeah. There's whole albums that are below average. I, I, we could start tossing out CDs. Absolutely, right. right. And so, you know, um, JR, I'm not messing with Billy Joel. I'm exactly, on I'm honoring Billy Joel yeah. because the idea is Billy Joel cared enough to show up again. Right. That's the point. It's not yeah. selfish. It's generous. Share enough, care enough, do it again. And if you don't have any skill, go get more skill. Right. Skill is acquirable. I don't care about talent. I think talent is mostly a myth, but skill, skill is something you can get. Yeah. You could always learn something new and then, and then work on that skill. You know, I talked to Christoph Neiman on the podcast and he's, you know, works for the New Yorker and, and he's, you know, high output, similar, sim, similar to you in, the, in that way. And I said to him, he said that, that like sitting down and like working at getting better every day no, will, it may take longer than you expect it to, but it will always surpass natural talent because natural talent implies that you're not really sitting down at the table to do the work. So eventually, someone's yeah. going to outwork you. You know, it's like push-ups kind of thing. It has to be every day. So, Jesus Christ, how many, how many, uh, <laughs> how many cliche things did I put in one podcast? Okay, good. Um, my my cousin Caleb, I'm going to take some questions here. Um, is the secret volume? I think so, right? I think so. Well, no, I think volume is a tactic. The right. secret is the practical empathy of realizing that if you want to be creative just for you, it's a hobby. And if you want to be creative for other people, it can be a profession. Yeah. But you don't know what they know. You don't want what they want. You don't believe what they believe. And so you've got to do it for other people. You are in a genre. You might not want to acknowledge you're in a genre, but you are. Right. Yeah. And so your work is going to rhyme with the work of someone who came before. That's part of what it means to be a professional. Yeah. And if you commit to being a professional, one of the tactics is to make small promises, keep them, make more promises. So when I started my blog, it was a lot like when you started your podcast. The first week, fewer than 10 people read it. How could it be any other way? For and sure. two, month, two months into it, it was still 100 people. Yeah. Should I have waited until I had 10,000 readers before I started my blog? That yeah. would have been impossible. Right. And then you gain that momentum from, from each one. Like it, I, I hear like my early podcasts, you know, like with Debbie Millman and, and stuff like that. And I just have this kind of like academic tone, which is really inauthentic to, to who I am as a person. Whereas now it's like, I kind of just, you know, wave my freak flag and, 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 and myself. And sometimes I hear it back, I'm like, oh, it's too much or it's too much of this. But 
I, if I don't like it, it's probably a good indication that I'm, I'm being authentic and I'm being myself. So when you have every episode and you show up, this interview is going a hell of a lot better since the last time I talked to you, that, hopefully. Uh, that being said, though, I've also done like 100 podcasts within that. And I, and I get great joy out of seeing, like, seeing the difference. So just showing up every day is so important. So let's see if we can get some of these. Some let's, do a shout, let's do a shout out to Jeff Goins, who's here. Nice. Uh, successful author, brilliant thinker. Uh, good guy. Thanks for open, coming, Jeff. Open invite to come on the podcast. Any friend of uh, Seth Godin is a friend of mine. And I don't say that about a lot of people because I've said that before. And next thing you know, it's like, hi, I'd like to introduce you to this. And you're like, oh, my God. Um, okay, so what about people? And I know all this, you know, this you know, sidebar here. I, I, I know all this. But what about people who are going to say about Seth, I'm at home. I don't have the right equipment. I don't have a MacBook Pro that I, I can't get Adobe. I'm like, you know, I have a Chromebook. I don't have a good, a good enough camera. Yeah. Give it to so me. Tell let, me. Let's, let's go all the way back to Karl Marx, okay, 150 okay. years ago. His, he pointed out that the person who owns the means of production is going to come out ahead. If you, right. own the fact, if you own the factory, it's better than being the worker. Mm -hmm. And Adam Smith said the same thing. You used to, if you were a professional pin maker, you could only make 10 pins in an hour. The pins in your shirt, 10. Right. But with a pin making machine, someone with no training could make 5,000 pins an hour. So yeah. the machine creates the value, own the machine. Mm -hmm. So here's the question. What's the machine now? The machine is the one you're holding in your hand. Mm -hmm. You have the same machine that they have at every high tech company. You have the same machine as everybody else. It's a phone, it's a computer, it's a communications device. Yeah. And if you need a better one, well, when your library reopens, they'll let you use a better one. Right. That's not the issue. That yeah. is not the issue. If you think you're going to make it as a photographer because you have a better camera than me, no, that's not what's going to happen. Yeah. Owning a camera does not make you a photographer. It makes you a hobbyist. What makes you a professional photographer is you take pictures for a living. Yeah. How do you take pictures for a living? Mm -hmm. Take them to people who want to buy them from you. That's how you do it. Now, does that mean you get to take whatever pictures you want? Absolutely not. Does right. that mean you get to take pictures like everybody else takes? No, because if you're taking pictures like everybody else takes, they'll just take them without you. But right. if you have a specificity, a peculiarity, if you're able to show up in a place where you are the one and only, right? Have right. Chase Jarvis type something. character or someone like that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Chase Jarvis, great guy. What did Chase the actually man. have? The nicest right? guy. We both nicest good guy. Good network we got going on here. Chase is a professional's professional, and he's made a ton of money. But more important than that, he's changed a lot of lives. What tools did Chase Jarvis have access to that you don't? Not right. one. Right. And initially, it just came from, I think it was his, his uh, forgive me for not getting it perfectly correct here, but I think it's like his grandfather passed away. Great book, by the way. His new book is amazing, Creative Calling. Um, sorry to just plug somebody else's book on here, but anyway. Uh, but, you know, he talked about, like, it kind of just fell into his lap, and he did it every day. And, again, the same thing you were saying before, so that's good. Can, can we do? Can we go to Chief Neef's question? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Bail me out of this, Seth. Here we go. <laughs> no, I wasn't bailing you out. I just saw no, it go no, by. No, no, no. Did you see it or do you want me to say it? I, I, I just kind of lost. Yeah, go ahead and say okay. it. Okay. So the question is, what if you don't know what your calling is? What if you don't know what to do? And this is really common. Yeah. But no one has a calling. I, when I was five years old, it did not come to me that one day I would be some internet guy. They didn't even have the internet yet. Right? No one has a calling. We do something and then we pretend it's our calling, not the other way around. Yeah. And if you are waiting for an engraved invitation from your subconscious, it's not going to show up. That yeah. what, what Pressfield would agree with me on is this is resistance talking. That if you keep jumping from thing to thing saying, well, it's not my calling, well, that's a way of hiding. Mm -hmm. So here's the way I propose you get around it. It's a simple tactic. Next time you get to the supermarket, even if you're under quarantine, buy one of those six packs of popsicles. It doesn't matter if they're lemon, orange, any of the good flavors. Red, white, blue. Come on. Those are fine. Those are, eat, those are the best. Eat six of the popsicles and then dry out the sticks. Okay? So now you're going to write on each one of the sticks one of the things you think you could do. I want to 
run a circus. I want to be a professional photographer. Any of the six that if you had one of them, that would be your calling. And then like shake them around and shake them around. And whichever stick you pick, that's what you have to do for the next two years of your life. So don't put it on a stick unless you're prepared to do it for the next two years of your life. And then whatever stick you pick, that's your stick. Yeah. That's it. That's it. We're done having this conversation. We don't need to talk about it anymore. I love it. Not you and me, you and your psyche. Right, right, right. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I think that um, just just setting the intent can be so much. I mean, so people say like, how do you how do you reach out to this? Like, how do you get in touch with this person? I literally, I could send you what I what I what I write. It's very clear. Uh, the same thing I sent to you was copy and pasted, but the intent was the same. The intent was the same, and it was it's like you don't have to. It's it's the movement on it. It, it, it's not what you write in the email. It's the fact that you type in Seth Godin, you know, whatever your email is, and then hit send, and then hope for the best. And take yeah, video it. this one, I'm not, them, I am not with you on this. I'm not with you on this. Okay, good. Why? <clears throat> in the podcasting fellowship, which is another one of the workshops we run, right? We say we need you to make a list of ten people, mm -hmm. and the tenth person is the home run get. It's Oprah, right? Whatever. It was you for a while, honestly, which is kind of cool. Thank you. And then we say, who's the, person, no, who's the person you got to get to get her? And who's the person you got to get to get them? And keep working your way up from number one is your sister or your next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. And number 10 is Oprah. Show me the chain. And what usually happens is one of two things. Either the chain has a huge miracle in it. Right. right? Like person number nine is my state senator. And yeah, person yeah. number 10 is Barack Obama. Right? Like, no, Barack Obama is not going to give you an instant yes because you interviewed the state senator. Sorry, yeah. you need a more realistic one. Or I tried this before. You are you are right. I, I'm I've done it. I've tried, and it doesn't always work. And then and then you feel like a real piece of shit because you're like, I don't even I don't even know if I really wanted to eat. Like, because on that interview, it never hits like you wanted to because this was early on. This is very early on. But I did though, and I'd be like, oh, if I interview that person, then I'll be on this person's radar. And then it didn't happen, and the interview kind of sucked because it was like. But now I just reach out to people I really want to talk to. Well, but people. also you, the point I'm trying to make is I didn't say yes to you because you wrote a good email. Right. I said yes to you because of what you had done before you wrote right. me the email. Yeah. And so most of the time that people fail, it's not because there's that leap between nine and 10. It's because they refuse to do one, two, three, four, five, and six. Yeah. They want to just go straight to number seven. Yeah. And so don't talk to me about hustling people. No one likes to be hustled. Don't say that what you need is a good list to uh, right. write out to. And I'm older than Malcolm Gladwell, so if it sounds like Malcolm Gladwell, maybe it's because sometimes Malcolm Gladwell sounds like me. I'm just saying. No, so Malcolm, a really long time. Hear, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, the point is yeah. you earn it. And social media is not the point. Social media is a souvenir of the work, yeah. but you got to do the work. Have, here's the thing I got to tell you about social media. Two things. One, yeah. friends are not your friends and likes don't mean like. They just are little symbols. Mm -hmm. And number two is social media has persuaded us to play their game so they make a profit, not so that we get what we want. Don't make your life about winning at social media because if you win at social media, you don't get very much anymore. Yeah, for sure. My dad's hype. My dad's like, I won tonight. I told my dad's like very conservative. As you can imagine, it's it's great at Thanksgiving when the when the artsy you know son comes in. My dad's very conservative, but he's like, oh, I got and I told her, and and I'm, I'm like, dad, 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 they're running ads against you. Mar like Mark Zuckerberg is counting up money right now. Like you're just like a you're just generating revenue for Facebook. He's like, no, I'm standing my ground. It's like, no, you're in your insular bu bubble. And you're kind of like a hamster running on a treadmill, and that treadmill is making Mark Zuckerberg money somewhere. Sorry, this probably won't say well with all my Facebook friends, so moving on. Uh, let's see some other questions in here. Any that you want to pick out? Well, the guys from Riverwood Acoustics, if I'm remembering, make a really cool uh, piece of stereo equipment. Cool. Um, and selling luxury goods during an upcoming recession or depression. So let's understand, what's a luxury good? A luxury good is not something that is better. Mm. That is got a different name. A luxury good is something that costs more than it should. And people buy things that cost more than they should because they cost more than they should. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why you go to Hermes. Hermes does not make a more reliable scarf or a better saddle. They make 
a saddle or a scarf that you can tell your friends you bought from Hermes. That's its value is that it costs more than it should. Right. Which means it's easier to sell luxury goods when there are more people who are trying to use money to impress the people around them. Yeah. And if you believe that the economy is going to contract, don't sell luxury goods. Sell <laughs> yeah, hold on to else. Them. Right. And resilience means being flexible enough to make it through a slog. And this is going to be a slog. And you can try to pretend it's not a slog. Some people are going to get away with that, but not most. Right. Because it's way easier to ski downhill than uphill. Yeah, and so, so my suggestion is figure out what people need, figure out what they believe and give them that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, for sure. And then weirdly enough, I feel like I, I've had, you know, the loss of, of my, my brother-in-law and had a lot, a lot of like trauma and stuff happening, in the, you know, over the trauma is always a weird word, but you know, I've, I've got a lot of hard licks in the past couple of years. And I feel like in a way, just in layman's terms, it's been kind of fucked up for a while now. So I'm kind of like, you know, I'm used to this, but there's a lot of people I'm seeing that are kind of living this lifestyle based on something that's going to have a lot of, of change and a lot of, you know, you know, you're talking about luxury and stuff like that. All of a sudden you're not going to be, you know, people are going to have to make sacrifices. And I think a lot will be kind of exposed, but if this is kind of your first time that you've really been rocked by something and this has happened on a global level from all over the world right now, what is your advice of, you know, in regards to being resilient? How do you be resilient when, when you're having a hard time, you know, getting out of bed in the morning or a hard time, you know, how, how do you keep the hope when there is not a whole bunch, a lot of light, if that makes sense, you know, cause I've been there before. So um, I used to get seasick on big boats mm -hmm. and I dealt with that problem by not going on big boats. Yeah. Um, but the reason you get seasick, if you get seasick, is because you are willing the uh, horizon to be flat like you're used to. Yeah. And the reason that sailors don't get seasick is because they know that the sea is moving. Mm -hmm. And they have trained themselves to expect that the sea is going to move. That is what it means to be resilient, is stop willing and wishing the world to go back to this perfect thing you remember. Yeah. It's not it's not going to for a long time. And you were all complaining back then anyway. That's my thing. I can't wait for things to go back to normal. You were all bitch moaning and complaining about Trump and about everything just before this all happened. I love this notion that we lived in some perfect world. Right. Like January was a shit show. I, like people have such short term memory and make everything so like nostalgic and beautiful. I hate that so, word normal. It's been bothering me. Do you feel right. the same when you see that? Well, it's always normal. Right? This is pretty when, normal. When people say, when is it going to get back to normal? The answer is this is normal. Yeah. It's always, this is always normal. That, you know, when I spoke to the newspaper publishers of America 20 years ago and explained to them in detail how newspapers were going to disappear, they're like, we'll outlast it. We'll it'll get back to normal. Yeah. No, normal. Normal is going to be different. So yeah. a resilient creative says, oh, well, this is the way it is now. How can I be of service? Yeah. Who can I help? How can I show up in a way that I can make a promise to someone who needs to hear it and keep that promise in a way that they'll want to pay me to do it again? Right. And that's how you become a professional. Mm -hmm. And so if you are used to making a living as a touring musician, for the next four months, you're not going to sell one ticket. Yeah. No. There are yeah, still people. It's weird. I had this whole, like, it feels like my right arm is like not there a little bit because there's that Saturday release. There's like that, that moment of humanity and like, I'm not getting that. And it's really like kind of screwing me with me a lot. Cause it's part of my normal. I'm such a hypocrite, but you know what I mean? No, it's well, weird. If you're missing that, so are other people. Yeah. So how could you connect them? How could you lead them? How could you replace that feeling with another feeling that they'll be glad they were able to engage with? Because generous doesn't mean free. Generous means you put in the effort to see somebody on their terms. Yeah. And uh, creatives for a living, we're not clerks. We're not bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. Our job is to invent the next thing. So go invent the next thing because that's your job. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like in the, in the same way like you were talking about, like plumber's block and stuff like that. By the way, that last thing before you were talking about, that was, um, hold on, what was it? The, the Inventor's Dilemma. That was it, right? That Innovator's was, Dilemma. 
Elevator is Dilemma, sorry. Spell check, yeah. did me wrong there. The late, the late Clayton Christensen. Yes, which you covered really great with uh, Chris Doe from the future. I love that interview, by the way. So, uh, Chris, admittedly, I watched before this and got prepared. And I remember how awesome you were during that interview because I was a little bit, you know, there's kind of like the myth of who you are and then there's who you actually are. And as I watched that podcast, I was like, oh, man, I'm hyped for this. So that's cool. Great to be catching up again. I saw somebody here is from the all, all NBA, NBA 5. Can you talk about why everything is okay to post? About why everything is okay to post? I wrote a post last week called, is everything okay? Is that the okay. question? Yeah, I am. Because my little uh, Robinson, who was in all NBA five. Right. So the post, basically, this, the, the subject line was, is everything uh, going to be okay? And the answer is, depends. If you want, if you mean, is everything the way going to be the way I wish and hope and dream it will be? The answer is no, it never will be, ever. Right. On the other hand, if we define okay to mean, is everything going to be the way it's going to be? The answer is yes, of course it is. Everything is always the way it's going to be. Yeah. So we get to decide what okay means. We get to decide what to do in the morning when we wake up. If we wake up in the morning and go, oh, that's what it's like. Time to get to work. We're going to be a lot more productive than if we get up in the morning and go, oh, it doesn't match my greatest dream. Forget it. I'm going back to bed. Right. Or kind of just do some sort of like social media thing. Like I was doing that for a while. I deleted Twitter off my phone. I'll be back on Twitter for people that follow it or whatever. Don't unfollow me, please. For the love of God, it's already so low. But I was just kind of in this cycle, this constant cycle of, of like, yeah, but I'll, but I'll figure it out. I think John Mayer had a great point about it. It's like, you know, it's one plus one equals zebra right now. And everyone just keeps going to see when will one plus one equal two. Because you're, yep. you're looking for that, again, reassurance. You're looking for that reassurance that things will get back to normal. But that's kind of just a, a treadmill. And it's almost better off to be like, okay, if the sky was falling today, if it was the end of the world, if this was it, if it's as bad as they say it is and we're all going to get white clear off the earth, which I hope never happens, if that's as bad as it is, would you, like, wouldn't you network like you've never networked before? Wouldn't you communicate and show love and show empathy and kindness versus just wallowing in self-pity, like scrolling to your phone. People, if you're doing that, it's okay. But stop fucking doing that. You know what I mean? Like, do you agree? There's a really good science fiction novel called The Last Policeman. Yeah. And the thesis is they, the telescopes are good enough that they find an asteroid that's headed toward us, and it's so big it's going to wipe out the Earth. Mm -hmm. And it's going to hit the Earth in a year. You so, have to this. I want to watch this. And if, so if they made it's – it's a, a book. And if they oh, – I'm sorry. If they made a, uh, if they made an announcement and told us that the world was going to end in a year, some people leave their spouse, become alcoholics, drug addicts, right. and go party. And some people just go to work tomorrow because they're basically saying to themselves, if it was good enough to do yesterday, it's good enough to do today. How can I be at service? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of like why I had this in mind. It was like, well, am I going to sit around and feel sorry for myself or – Maybe let's circle back with the friends that I made along the way, like yourself, and, and, and see where they're at. And uh, thus far, everyone's been, you know, like, it, 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 admittedly, everyone's a little bit freaked out. And that makes sense. And reevaluating things. And now you had, when I was watching the interview with Chris Doe from the future, shout out to the future, um, it was a year ago. And you kind of had your reservations about the way that society and, you know, the way that our kids are educated and stuff like that and how we're kind of, you know, uh, I forgot what the two generations were, but you basically said, like, you know, you hope that it sort of levels up, but you're always kind of dealing with the BS from the, you know, I'm butchering it here. But nonetheless, um, what do you think about this all now? And and I'm such an optimist sometimes, and I can't help but feel like there will be a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow and probably a lot of loss, but I feel that people are sort of coming together. And they're, and they're, the focus on the home is kind of like coming back in, like realizing what's important. And because I'm auditing my life and seeing what's important. But if, you know, hopefully when this all opens up, do you think that people will learn from those things or, or, or go right back to going on Twitter and fighting and stuff? You know, the power of the modern marketing industrial complex combined with the power of the modern educational industrial complex combined with the dark patterns that have been put into place to, uh, reward the worst angels of our nature for profit. Right, yeah. They're not going to be easy to overcome. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, that, sure. I, the only thing I know 
is we can't change a billion people. We can't even change a million people, mm -hmm. but each of us might be able to change 50 people or a hundred people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at Akimbo, we've got more than 20,000 grads, 4,800 people graduated the Alt MBA, uh, drip by drip. And then those people change other people. That's all we can do. Right. So, uh, I am an optimist that we can undo some of the brainwashing that has pushed people to want to consume at all costs to uh, pick fights instead of to make friends. Yeah. I'm not going to think it's going to happen universally. Right. I just think each of us has no choice but to do what we can do. Yeah. So um, before I forget, there's if you go to the freelancersworkshop.com, there's a purple circle at the top. And it's a hidden discount we give people just for insiders. Mm. It goes down in value every day. So cool. uh, freelance, the freelancersworkshop.com is a little purple circle. Check it out. For sure, for sure. Um, and also, you know, you have all the, like these different mediums. Um, let me just pull this up here. Um, all the, the, just letting you know, the questions stop moving on my screen. So I have I, to, every once in a while, put a thing and then it moves again. So you're going to have to look at the questions because they stop moving for me. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, um, let's see here. Um, we have very little time to answer ourselves. Hold on a second. Design problems are never black, but I'm, I'm reading as I talk here, so if it gets weird, I'll try and slow myself down. Design problems are never black and white. That's very true. Uh, though attempting to solve the problem, you'll often find and begin to define the problem. Do you agree? Right. Is that a quote from you? I feel like people are... Do people ever, like, has anyone ever sent you, like, a tattoo or something like that, of a quote or something like that? There's got to be one. Come on. A tattoo? Yeah, a tattoo. Two people named their kids after me, which I thought was fantastic. Wait, they named uh, kids Seth Godin? Or was it not, last name Godin? They didn't do the Godin part. <laughs> anyway. Oh, just Seth. Okay, that's a lot more. I thought they went, like, no. first and middle. No, that would, be, that, would be, that would be spooky. Anyway, yeah. um... I'm no, I think that, I think what someone was doing was uh, queuing up a question without putting a question mark right. um, at the end. And basically what they're saying is the reason we're, we do this, the reason we're creatives is because there isn't a right answer. The yeah. minute there's a right answer, you're a clerk. Okay? Right, right, right. So look forward to the fact that there is no right answer. Look forward to the fact that there is no clear path forward. But then... Instead of freezing and waiting for someone to tell you what the path forward is, you say, how do I define the problem? Mm -hmm. And the very act of defining the problem is how we go ahead and solve the problem. Yeah. So, you know, if we think about the Norman door, um, which is a, a super famous um, idea from a writer who has argued that design is important. His book, the, the Design of Everyday Things, goes into it, Don Norman. Right. And a Norman door is a door that should tell you without words whether you should push it or pull it. Because it's a tax on all of us to have to guess right. every time you come to a door what yeah. we should do. Think about all the time that's wasted. Mm -hmm. So what did Don Norman do? Well, what he did was he figured out the question. He didn't come up with how a Norman door solves it. There's a hundred ways. Mm -hmm. But first he started by saying, shouldn't a door announce to its very design how to use it? That's part of the process of designing anything. Coming up with the question yeah. helps you get 90% of the way there. Right. And then having empathy for people that have to then deal with that problem. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that, that's something that I've kind of learned with this podcast is it's like uh, uh, when you're in, in school for design, especially in the branding space, it's all, you know, the, the, the new people that are just coming into the program, they're always talking about logos and they're talking about how the importance of logos and about, did you see the, and then as you go through design school, you kind of learn that it's not so much about the, the logo, but the problems that business is trying to solve. And you're an expert at this. The fact that I'm even taking up airtime here makes me feel uncomfortable. Great. Damn it, I said I wasn't going to be fanboy, and I already did it. Um, what is your... Okay, wait, I had a question here. Well, I'm Good. ADD, here we go. We're going to land this thing eventually. Here we go. A uh, question from my cousin Kayla, who's great. One day, we'll both be working for her. Uh, what can creatives do to make the most of their time during the quarantine? I think we've covered that, but 
maybe like in a, just a creative way. If you're, you're not so much thinking about like, you know, like your purpose and stuff like that, just for fun. Like I made a whole yeah. theater in my, in my garage. It's been fucking awesome. I'm excited about it. Well, yeah. let me, let me try to come up with one that's a little bit more productive. Yes. So yeah, it's uh, not helping my productivity at all. I saw a guy who took a bunch of stock video footage and edited it together in a killer 90 second montage. It was on Boing, on Boing Boing today. It probably took him a week. It's magnificent. So here's the thing. No one was, he wasn't working for anyone for the last week anyway. And now he's just put this sizzle reel in his reel. That's stunning. Like if I needed a video editor, I'd hire him this minute. Why right, wouldn't you hire him? Stock footage, this thing where he can right. do the original content. Yeah. Exactly. Another guy put up a video on, I think it was on Design 88 or Design 99, whatever it's called. And he, um, he took the new BMW and he redesigned it, the grill, to look like it's supposed to look like. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. Nice. Right? And it probably you took him. With that legal department, though, you don't want that, that big, fancy BMW envelope show up. Nah. He, he didn't <laughs> do anything. He didn't sell a car. No, he made right, a yeah. video using fair use. Right. And, true. Right? So the beauty of it is BMW is not going to hire him, but lots of people are going to see that he has a design vocabulary and a point of view, and skills. And he just added something to our conversation and to his portfolio. Well, mm -hmm. what if you challenged yourself to pull eight late nights in a row working for the worst client you've ever worked for, you, to actually do really good work? Yeah. And to say at the end of a week or two, look, I made all this. This charity I care about, I redesigned their website without asking them. Here, I sent it to them. Maybe they'll use it. This uh, I'm a copywriter. I, I found a candidate I believe in. I wrote 20 emails that she can use to raise money. I just sent it to the campaign manager, right? right? So you just go and you go and you go because no one's slowing you down. Right. What are you waiting for? Yeah, and that's one of the things I always say, like uh, like to, when I go and talk at like universities or stuff, or I'm, I'm in the classroom, because I have a lot of empathy for, because I had a really shitty attitude. You wouldn't know it. You would think I'd be like academic. But all this ADD in the college setting, total nightmare, right? But when I go back and I talk to them, I say it's it's like, well, they're, oh, well, the teachers did this, or or I need this client to 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 get work. Okay, like here's the brief. You you got the job at Nike. Show me what you got. And other than that, you're full of shit, and that's an excuse. Yeah. And, it's, and, it, and they're like, well, yeah, but I don't have it. It's like no. Like if, if you could do it, if you could do it better, show me. Like I have a, a friend, Anna Fine, who was a design director at RGA and a Droga Five. And the way that she really, like I, I said, you know, how'd you climb the ladder? How'd you get up? She said, one day I went to the, the, the head person and I said, hey, here's the presentation. I did it like you asked me to. I fulfilled all the needs of what you've asked. I hit every mark. And I think it sucks. And here's what I would have done. And the next thing you know, she's a design director and leading the biggest advertising agencies in the world. If you can do it better, show me and then amplify that online and use, you know, the internet or whatever. So love that. Coming up on Saturday night. She'll be on the show. Love that. And here's what it says on my coffee mug. Yes. This might not work. I like that. And that's why people don't do it. Right. They don't do it because they don't want to say that part. Yeah. Failing is, is, is so much a part of it. And I remember very vividly, like when we had that first conversation, you know, I just, it was weird. I had nothing. It was like, I got, sorry, I have 20% battery remaining. Um, I got off of that call and um, I went back to my crappy apartment and I didn't really have a lot. And I kind of just like continued to go down the road. But um, I wish I failed more because there was so much ego type. There's so much like story. Like you kind of have to edit your story of like, what are the things that are limiting you? Because nine times out of 10, it's yourself. I, my yeah. biggest thing, the biggest mountain that I can climb is the day that I grab my inner, you know, pansy, whatever you want to call it, whatever the word you're supposed to use is, and tell it to shut up and do what my heart desires. I'm getting better at dealing with that, but um, as sometimes when life gets problematic, it's difficult to, to not allow that story to happen because it's within us, it's meant to protect us, but hitting the override button or the, you know, the lizard brain. Talk about that for people that are that might be new to you. What I'm okay, so um, first, if you haven't read Pressfield's War of Art, go read War of Art. Uh, and I did I read, read it, by the way. I read it. I love it. 
It's an amazing book. And Steve, my friend Josh. Steve emailed me today. What a great guy. Yeah. And um, I read it when I was writing Lynchpin. And right around then, I read this research about the lizard brain. We have two brains. This one right here, the amygdala, it's the size of two right. small beans. It's the one that's responsible for anger, revenge, uh, and fear. And it's right here, so it's next to our spine, so it can take over. And when it's dormant, we're, we're humans. And when it's not dormant, we freak out. So that's why we fly off the handle. And then it's like, because people like, you know, just think about it and calm down first. Right. And it's, it's just exactly. like, bing. It's like throwing exactly. a grenade. It's like all of a sudden, it's just it's gone. Bef and it gets out ahead of me. And then right. I go downstairs or go for a walk or whatever. I'm like, why can't I calm down? This, this, why, why did I allow that to happen? Right. So you need to train yourself that every time the resistance shows up, every time the lizard brain shows up, you, got, you can't talk it down. You just got to wait it out. You got to wait it out, right? So people asked about the mug. Lori Coop, uh, uh, a, a brilliant potter, I hired her to make 200 of these, which we gave to people in the Kickstarter that I did years ago. Yes. So on this side is the lizard for the lizard brain. Oh, nice. Right? And on this side, on some of them it said linchpin, and on some of them it said this might not work. And so there's only four left in my office. I'm forwarding them. Uh, and Lori, as far as I know, never made another pot because 200 is a lot. Yeah. Um, so it's I, I probably really take good really, at making mugs, though, to your point. Yeah. Take yeah. really good care of this. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, I saw a question here. I saw my wife Sammy's in here. Hold on. Um, this might not work. as an excuse for procrastinate. At least something I learned about myself recently. Yeah, procrastination and and stuff like that. Also, I think I think inspiration too. You know, I talked to uh, this guy. Um, Steve uh, Babcock, he was the uh, chief creative officer at VaynerMedia. Now he's doing um, his own thing, doing in-house stuff. Um, it's so hard to keep track of where everyone's working these days. I hope that's the latest. But um, he had talked about, you know, a lot of people are kind of just like rev revving their engine at like the start line. Eventually you have to put it in, you know, like you can get really, you put on like, you know, you put on a Gary Vee video or a Seth Godin video. You're kind of revving the engine. You're like, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But one of the biggest things is just like a, just driving off and, and getting out of that space of looking for inspiration and just allowing yourself to be shitty. But you've written so much. You've had so many, you know, best-selling books and stuff like that. Doesn't that require a lot of time allocated towards finding out who like the best writers are and learning from that? Like, where do you, for, like, where do you hug that line of like recreational activity and like learning and then something okay. that will actually inspire you? So there, there are two parts to what you're talking about. Yeah. I want to start with procrastination. So Lauren Michaels may or may not have said this. I will pretend he did. Okay. Saturday Night Live does not go on at 11.30 because it's ready. It goes on at 11.30. Because it's done. Because it's 11.30. 11.30, right, yeah. Yeah. That's it. For sure. And you may have noticed that not once in 40 years have they said, sorry, it, the episode isn't ready. We'll be here in half an hour. Not once. Right. And so you make a commitment. The commitment is, I'm never going to touch the snooze button. Not once ever again. I'm never going to miss a deadline. Not once ever again. Right. I'm never going to go over budget. Not once ever again. It's a choice. Yeah. Either you do or you don't. So we're not going to ship it because it's perfect. We're going to ship it because it's 1130. So now that we know that, we better get it perfect before 1130 because we're yeah. going to ship it at 1130 no matter what. I love that. So that's the first part. No plumber's second, block. Plumber's block. And the second part is what uh, about skill? Well, I don't go to meetings and I don't watch television. So I have seven or eight hours a day that most people don't have access to. Right. And if you care, you can do that. And if you do that, you can learn seven hours worth of skill every day. Mm -hmm. What would happen if you actually learned seven hours of skill through practice, through effort, through contribution, through connection every day? Right. Right? Sure. I mean, here's the deal. There are a lot of people on this call right now, over 100. You can find each other. Start oh, a mastermind. Yeah, it's not my, it's probably mostly you. <laughs> start, a master, start a mastermind group. Meet once right. a week and challenge each other to show each other your skills and your promises. Then do it again next week. Oh, you're not serious. But if you are serious, you can go do that. Yeah. And so we have access to all this information, but we don't trust ourselves enough to leap. And it's the trusting 
That's so important. Do you trust yourself enough to become a better version of yourself? Right. Because if you become a better version of yourself, you have to produce more. You have to make bigger promises. You have to be a different person, right? Yeah. And what I am arguing is that we've been brainwashed to not trust ourselves because there are people in power who want us to trust them instead. And there's right? a lot of money in you getting better. There's always a, there's a shit ton of money in the world of, of we're going to tell you how to do it in these easy steps. You know, so, so put your credit card information here. And we're going to teach you how to be a New York Times bestselling author kind of thing. Because why the fuck not? It's a promise that they could, you know, I would. I'm kind of doing it in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like I can, get, I can have, I can scale conversations with Seth Godin. I can scale conversations with Michael Beirut or whoever it is. And even myself, I talk to people all the time. Technically, if I was taking the advice of everyone and actually putting into effect all that I had learned, I'd probably be like a lot further along, but I'm not. There's a great uh, online class with, uh, again, Chris Doe from the future. Just getting a lot, it's top of mind. But he had every, um, every hour was a post-it. And he, and he had like uh, some, some people like my age there. And he said, here's the board. Here's, here's 24 hours. Every hour is a post-it. And write on that what you do. And, and be, be honest about it because this is an exploration. If you watch Shameless every night for one hour, that's one post-it. And you ain't getting that post-it back. And if you're honest with yourself, most people would look at the post-its and go, what am I doing with my life? Right? Like, sorry, I keep cursing. I might be the first person who's ever cursed in the Seth Gordon podcast, but I'll, I'll wear that for pride. It's your <laughs> podcast. You can do anything you want, man. I'm just here to hang out. Yeah, I know. It's been good. Listen, I know that Instagram always, always uh, cuts us off here, but uh, you have a, a great podcast that's out. It's from an ancient word. It's Akimbo. Am I saying that correctly? A-K-I-M-B-O. You can find... The workshops at akimbo.com and the podcast at akimbo.link. Anything else you'd like to promote? What book, what book number are you on now? How many uh, books have you written in your life? The, the, the uh, 19 bestsellers, the 20th book will be announced one day. We'll see. Um, but all I want to promote is the people who are on this call. I want to promote the people who have the means of production, the people who care enough to call themselves creative, right? I want you to go do a ruckus. I don't care if you do it with me or not. I just need you to level up and make a bigger promise. Yeah. I feel like I've leveled up a little bit since the last time. Admittedly, I'm still kind of lazy, still got to overcome some of my own inner BS, but you're helping me get there. You're maybe, amazing. Maybe we'll start back in a few years. Seth, it's been a, a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. You're the man. See, people, I told you, be nice. Don't be intimidated. Peace out. I can do it. I can't do it with this hand, though. If I, if I pull these two together. All right. That's it. Take it easy. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.